So the old transfer gossip, it's rife, people. So who better to have a little natter with? We're gonna go through the most pertinent transfer rumors going around at the moment in the world of football with Kristen Hennish, because he knows more than most of, most of us all, certainly you. Kristen, how are you, mate? Are you good? I'm not bad, thanks, mate. Cool. You? you like that introduction? I thought it was all right. Loved it. That will not get me any hit in the comments. <laughs> Absolutely not. Everything that Kristen says is correct. And if it's not, let him know in the comments below. Let's kick off with Christian Eriksen, who's come out and uh, been very clear in how he wants his future to go. He said this, I feel that I am at a stage of my career where I would like to try something new. He's told the Danish newspaper Extra Bladet, which I'm sure you've got a subscription to, Christian. Um, I have the deepest respect for everything that is happening at Tottenham and it would not be something negative to stay. But I've also said that I would like to try something new. The best thing is always for it to happen quickly but in football, things take time. So Real Madrid are the team that have been linked with Ericsson for quite a long period of time. And um, his contract is a big part in this. Um, but it looks like Spurs want something like £130 million from Real Madrid. Um, what's your initial reaction to, to these comments and the link with Real Madrid? Do you think it's something that, that you could see happening? I'm not surprised by the comments, is the first thing I would say. Because I think at the minute, Spurs are in a bit of an awkward, almost contradictory situation because, yes, they've had a great season that got them to the Champions League final, but I do think they're at a bit of a crossroads with Pochettino, with a lot of the key players, and Ericsson fits into that category. I'm not surprised that we're seeing Real Madrid linked with him. Um, there's also been talk of Manchester United fairly recently, and I think he fits in at any one of those teams. He is a wonderful playmaker mm. um, and a player that I really enjoy watching. Whenever I think of him, I think of that game for Denmark against the Republic of Ireland where just everyone else might have well gone home because I think he was the only player on that pitch that night that, that really caught the eye and really entertained people. So I, th I think he is looking at the situation as, am I going to achieve what I want to achieve with this Tottenham side? And that might hurt Tottenham fans to hear that. And it's not something I necessarily always agree with when players say, you know, I have to move on. But I think for him, he's, he's trying to be a bit pragmatic with his own career. He's trying to think, Am I going to do what I want to do if I stay here? Possibly not. Yeah, I think he. I think he made this decision quite a while ago, to be honest. I think that's because otherwise he would have signed a, a new deal. I think Spurs would have liked him to have done that, and it, they, he would have got that done. But I, th I think there's there's always that allure of, of Real Madrid and Barcelona, regardless of of the stage that they're, they're at as a as a team. Their Premier League points total has dropped for the last two years now. Yeah. It's, it's I think it's gone down 27 points since two seasons ago. Mm. And I think to me, when I look at the situation, there's almost an air of Luka Modric about it. There's a player here that's very good that I think has ambitions that right now Spurs just can't seem to match. They could, I think, if they went out and really invested. But even then, there's an inherent risk in that because you destroy the continuity that's kind of got them to where they are now. So I think to me, it does, it does just feel a little bit like the Modric situation where yeah. he's ready to go and and play with players that he feels like will make him better. Yeah, uh, Luka Jovic has already gone to Real Madrid. They've been linked with Eden Hazard as well. And at AS, uh, the Spanish outlet, is saying that they've got £460 million to, to spend. My final question for Real Madrid before we move on to the, the, the next um, bit of transfer news is, where is all this money going to come from to, to buy all these players? I, I can't even... Even Real Madrid, like obviously the a giant team, but £460 million, that seems like too much. Is there any way that say that the Eden Hazard thing might not work out because they can't have both of these or have they got enough money? No, I think I think a club like Real Madrid will always have money and, and the two key reasons for that is first, they've got insane revenue streams. Look at closer to home, Manchester United, how they've got a noodle partner, they've got a tractor sponsor, they've got... To, yeah, Every single aspect of that football club feels like it has an advertisement attached to it. And at the same time, a club the size of Real Madrid will never struggle to find people willing to lend the money. That's the other thing you have to remember. Banks will ha happily trade on Real Madrid because it's Real Madrid and this idea that they're too big to go bust, which is a separate discussion for another time. But I think mm. for that reason alone, yeah, they'll, they'll never struggle to, to fill the coffers when it comes to transfer time. Yeah, I mean, an absolutely huge um, summer for Real Madrid and... and it Luka Jovic, so that's different. Obviously, he's more of an up-and-coming player. But Hazard and Eriksen, this is the big contract. This is the big move for them. So they are going to cost a decent amount of money. They've only got one year left in his contract, uh, Eriksen. So £130 million, for me, feels like a little bit too much. But uh, they've been flirting for a while. So it looks like one that could happen. Uh, moving on. Man City um, have 
they've triggered Zhao Felix's release clause, uh, apparently, um, for 106 million. Um, the next best was apparently Real Madrid with an 80 million pound uh, bid. Uh, for people who don't know much about Zhao uh, Felix, uh, Benfica striker, but what's his sort of style of play and is it a style of play that would fit well at Man City? What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I, c- I could see him, you know, because Pep Guardiola has started this sort of false eight role that we talk about with De Bruyne, with Bernardo Silva. I think he slots into that role fairly comfortably. He is an attacking midfielder, a bit of a playmaker. I've had a couple of nerd conferences with Statman Dave about him a, a few years back when he was in Benfica B and, and was just doing ridiculous things that, that you've probably all seen on highlight compilations by now yourselves. So I think, yeah, he fits into a Man City system fairly comfortably. Um, in terms of the price... I think Benfica see the opportunity to make a lot of money here because their academy, it's been very profitable for them, but not always as much as it should have been. So Bernardo Silva is a great example. They lost him for a lot less than what you would say was his actual market value just because they didn't see the potential in that. So I think they're a lot more focused in terms of, OK, let's let's properly be diligent and, and evaluate this talent properly before we put it onto the market. And, and I guess even Luka Jovic is an, another good example. He's not a... Benfica Academy product, but he was someone that they gave to to Frankfurt for pretty much six million, and, and I think there's talk of a thirty percent sell on. Right. But I'm sure they'll look at it as we could have had sixty million if we'd been really smart about it. So I think for a club like Benfica, it's always about trying to be as efficient as possible when you're selling in the market. Yeah, because I guess it, yeah, it has been such a, a hotbed for players who've gone on to do you know go to those bigger clubs. But I think does it does, do people feel that Benfica are a little bit of a soft touch in terms of how much you're going to have to pay as well? No, I would I would go the opposite. I think negotiating with Portuguese teams is actually really difficult. Um, at the top three, especially, I think right. they really do drive a hard bargain. Um, I think we've seen down the years there have been players that have come out of Portugal that we think, yeah, they've absolutely rinsed whoever's bought <laughs> that player there. I'm not going to name names because then I meet them on the street. But it, it's enough to say that, yeah, I think for them it's more a case of they weren't able to structure deals or they didn't see the potential or weren't able to get what they they should have been yeah. now. But again, anything like that, and I say this a lot about transfers, it's so steeped in hindsight that you have to kind of acknowledge for the context of the situation as well. Yeah, uh, 90 years old, um, had an incredible season for this season, still still going for the summer. He's got the semi-final against Switzerland for, for Portugal. So people are going to be watching the Nations League. Make sure you check him out and you can see a bit more of, of the talent that he's got. Final thing on that with Man City, is what might be a kind of a smart thing with him, although he's 19 years old and you're going to spend a lot of money on him, is that um, even the, the guys that are in those positions at the moment, um, Bernardo Silva, David Silva, players like that, or even further up forward, he can play as a second striker as well. Um, you spend that large amount of money because you've got it if you're Man City, but I don't think he has to go straight into the starting eleven next season, does he? As a 19-year-old... Guardiola can kind of get his hands on him and, and develop him um, for, for 18 months before he truly, truly uses him. Do you think that's part of the thinking here? Possibly, yeah. I think, look, Man City have had a lot of negative press um, the last few months and I can appreciate both sides of that argument. But I think one thing unanimously we can say about them is their transfer strategy for the last 24 months maybe, has been pretty much flawless. Claudio Bravo, to me, is the only real misstep that they've made. And they really corrected that one quickly with the signing of Edison. Yeah. And I think their ability to plan, not just, okay, who do we need this summer, but what are we doing in 12 months' time, in 18 months' time, signing contracts to guys like Bernardo Silva so they've got an extended stay there. Okay. Their planning is is really meticulous and actually quite admirable in a lot of ways. And I think for that reason, yeah, I could totally see a situation where Jao Felix comes in, maybe shadows De Bruyne, shadows uh, Bernardo Silva to, to lean on football manager for a second there and, and essentially has a much more protracted, sort of smooth uh, transition into the first team yeah, long term exactly and uh, yeah, a lot of uh, Portuguese speakers in that team as well which would make it a lot easier for him as well let's move on to the other side of Manchester United so busy um, I was listening to Sam Peoples from United Peoples TV and he was saying that Man United have been linked with 60 players so far this this summer um, it looks like there's going to be a lot of change there and one of the dream signings is uh, Matthias De Ligt 
um, from Ajax. But there is a real sort of, I mean, dare I even say the phrase bidding war, but there's five offers at least, it seems. But what's come out um, today is that Liverpool are kind of in the hunt for it as well. Again, Nations League, uh, it looks like he'll be playing alongside Van Dijk for, for Holland. And Jurgen Klopp wants to kind of recreate that at Liverpool. Do you, do you, where do you see him going? Do you think that might be something that might be appetising enough to go and play with Van Dijk week in, week out? Or do you think it's just an opportunistic moment from Liverpool to try and snatch him from those other players? Or do you see him going to Man United or Barcelona? What do you think? I could, personally, I could see him going to Barcelona. Um, I'm always worried to rule out he'll not go here, he'll not go there, mm. unless you know, you've got information to, to that effect. I think he would absolutely improve Manchester United's backline. I think there are a few players who would do that. Koulibaly of Napoli is another great example of a player I think that would strengthen them and give them that leader with which to build a foundation because I think that's something we forget sometimes you have to build a whole back three or back four or back five however it's not just one person that person can raise the level like Van Dijk has but ultimately it's about unlocking that potential which is what we've seen with Jean Matip which I would feel a bit harsh on him if he just got kicked to the side having been a fairly reliable player for them this season. Um, yeah. yeah, and there's Joe Gomez as well, you know, has done brilliantly until he got injured as well. So, I, I, yeah, I, I wonder with that one. But it would it would be one of those where you got Jurgen Klopp, you kind of got to respect that, that they go and win the Champions League and look, you mm-hmm. go and strengthen even more. You said Koulibaly there. There's news at uh, Correa de la Sport is saying that United have... Uh, put an eighty-four million pound bid uh, to Napoli for the twenty-seven-year-old, um, so that might play a part in it in terms of other players being uh, sort of allowed access to kind of make that offer and try and get delit. Because if United have got Koulibaly, and I think initially it, it looked like it was Man United or Barcelona, then that might play uh, a part in this. The other one, uh, Pogba, that you know, story that will imaginably rumble on just because of the amount of clicks it will naturally get when it's Paul Pogba, but Juventus. Um, coming in and, and having a, a quick word about a, a possible swap deal with Pogba and a few different people. So one, uh, so the Express has said that it could be, there could be a swap between Dybala and Pogba. There's also been talks about players like Alexandro as well, Douglas Costa as part of a, a swap deal. What is your general understanding of, of swap deals? Do they, do they really happen when there's not that much money to be made for, from anyone? Well, we saw it with Alexis Sanchez and Mkhitaryan. Yeah. Um, who got the best end of that deal is is a difficult one, I think, to come to a consensus on because I don't think either player has truly thrived um, at the club that they ended up at. But yeah, I, th- I think when you've got a financial situation like that where you have players to get rid of and also you want to play, it can benefit because I think we talked about Real Madrid having seamlessly ending endless pot of, of money not every club is in that position and sometimes it's about having to deal and and I think for a club like Juventus if they feel as I think a lot of European clubs do they can get the most value by selling to the Premier League that in turn will facilitate them bringing back and I think that's the key uh, interesting change here is essentially a change in Italian tax law makes it a potentially more viable deal for Juventus from a wages perspective because they would have to commit less money gross to match the figure net that Pogba would want. The tax rate has dropped. So what Juve would have to commit, I think the figure was roughly around 15 million euros net, which now would be 21 million euros gross, as right. opposed to, I think it was much closer to 30 uh, before that. Uh, the other thing with Juventus is is the manager situation. Uh, Allegri is obviously gone, um, who Pogba you know, had, a, had a good relationship with. Um, but if Sari is the man that comes in... Do you, I would imagine that's going to play a factor in, in the players that, that come in, both for you know the, the style of play that Sari likes to play, but also from the other side of it, Pogba, do, would he want to go and play for, for a manager like Sari with the, kind of the, the, the struggles and, and the moments that he's had in the Premier League th- this season? I think that's going to play uh, a big part in it as well. But it looks like Juventus are in the sort of market for a midfielder uh, this season. They didn't want to spend the, the money on um, Sergei Milinkovic-Savic um, they wanted 53 million, and that's two, no. They sorry, they offered 53 million. Lazio want 90 million, so they're turning to Pogba and seeing if something can happen. Um, do you do you, do you expect that to happen? Would you? It'd be a bit of a shock, wouldn't it, if if he left Man United? I, I'd be surprised. If I'm very honest, I, I do believe that Pogba would would want to go. I don't think he's that happy there. I think yeah. this homecoming, this return. 
I, I don't think it's ever looked that comfortable, but maybe a few months under Solskjaer when he first came in, where it seemed like, okay, things have kind of clicked. I think in terms of going back to Juventus, I th- Milinkovic Savic has a similar profile to me when I watch him in terms of the way that he plays, what yeah. he offers. But again, that cost, Lazio just aren't dropping that price anytime soon. And he is a bit inconsistent from my experience, Savic. So I, I would be hesitant to commit that much money. Mm. You could argue that Pogba has been in a similar boat with consistency issues. But at the same time, I would sort of counter that with when he was at Juve in a system that was, I would say, quite geared towards him. It had a lot of uh, contingencies to, to make up for things that maybe he wasn't great at that's when he got the best out of them that's when they got to the Champions League final and, and were just simply undone by a truly brilliant Barcelona team which is, mm. is no shame in yeah very true uh, we uh, we'll move on well, part of the, the reason that Pogba might stay and be a bit happier next season might be with the, the buys that, that Man United make and one that they're another player that they're linked with is the, so the other side of the coin when it comes to transfers is okay, there's all these big clubs going, I want, I want one of these, I want one of these. But often they, they pick off those players that have been built up somewhere else. And Leicester City, it's going to be a massive summer for them because they've, I think they've finally got a squad there um, for the first time since that, that title winning season that people are starting to think the, there are players here who are really, really sort of evolving and improving and you could have a team that could, could do something, could start to kind of threaten that, that top six. Um, the main man for them, James Madison, who created more chances per game than Messi and Hazard last season. Um, he's linked with Liverpool, Man City, Man United and Spurs. Right? They're all uh, interested in, in him. Um, both him and uh, Maguire are, are sort of on the table in terms of uh, people uh, are going. James Madison, first of all, where, where do you think if he was to leave, and I get the impression he's a very ambitious guy, um, if he wanted to leave, where do you think would be the best fit for, for him to, to go to? Um, I, I like him in a Tottenham shirt. I think that is a situation where they've shown an ability to bring younger players on, um, to give them that structure and that confidence more than anything to, to really achieve their potential. I think if I'm trying to interpret it based on him as a person, I think the confidence in him that he's shown as a person means he probably wants to go to Old Trafford and lead that revolution. Um, because that's the thing about him he's got a lot of flair he's got a lot of self-confidence he's very much cocky bordering on confident that, yeah. that sort of odd line that, that you see with, with young players now and I think ultimately yeah so somewhere like Manchester United where he's going to be the star man where he's going to be able to to, to sort of drape all that flair that he's got over Old Trafford I think that would appeal to him mm. I mean it would be I, I agree with you I think there's, there's a pressure that he would enjoy um, at, at Man United. Harry Maguire, team talk is saying that um, he's spoken with Leicester City and the uh, club's officials there. They have a price tag of 85 million and they've said that they're willing to let him go if that's met. Um, they are, uh, Harry Maguire himself has said nothing about it. He says he wants to concentrate on England right now. Um, but it looks like uh, Man City uh, is the most likely destination for him. Um, again, Man City, there's, they're not messing about. Um, but with Vincent Company going, they want to get another centre-back in. And Do you think he's the right kind of fit for Man City? Yeah, I think so. I think he showed that when he went to the Etihad and he decided to go on a 60, 70-yard yeah. run with the ball down the left wing. <laughs> so um, I think he's, he's got a lot of ability on the ball, which is important in that Man City side. And I think, honestly, in the wider context, the Madison deal, the Maguire deal, it shows you that a lot of England's development comes from the Football League. Um, Coventry with Madison is where he started. Sheffield United, where Maguire started. This is essentially a system where I think the lower leagues are having a huge impact on the England team uh, as a whole. And I think for Maguire, yeah, it's, it's almost a similar story to Ericsson. I think I think he's reached a point as, as almost meteoric as we look at his rise because it was kind of from nowhere with Hull and then straight to Leicester yeah. and then England star last summer now possibly at Man City, the, the Premier League champions. I think he's looking at it and saying, well, there's, you know, there's things I want to achieve as well. There's things I want to... And I think that's always the struggle for teams is that we romanticise football a lot and I appreciate that. I'm very guilty of it. But there's an element of its business at the end of the day. It's not personal. And it's that idea of if you've got ambitions that can't be matched, how, how do you kind of deal with those two? How do you sort of accept those two things? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that massive calls for them both because they could. Part of me thinks like you, you need to, if you're at Leicester City, you need to get them all in a room and go, look, guys, look around. You've got something exciting here. Maybe like wait a season. 
But for them to have that kind of collective about them, it's just you're asking a bit too much, aren't you? And final thing, final piece. Let's, get, let's head over to MLS for a second as we've got Chris here with us. David Beckham wants to sign uh, Barcelona and Uruguay striker Luis Suarez um, for his new MLS side uh, into Miami. That's at B Soccer saying that. And um, there's got to be, you're always looking for that kind of first marquee signing for, for a new club in, in MLS. Um, David Beckham, obviously, he's got, the, you know, he can speak with anyone at any moment. Um, but do you see this one happening, Luis Suarez? What's the, what's the sort of, what's the situation with uh, Inter Miami at the moment? Well, they're trying essentially to build a club from the ground up. So a ground is a major aspect for them. They're still trying to work out the specifics of that, where it will look. I think they've secured Lockhart Stadium, but there are a lot of moving parts with that situation that make it hard to track on a day-to-day basis. Mm. In terms of the actual playing stuff, the stuff that we all care about here, yeah, I think Suarez is the kind of player that that I could see him targeting. I think it works. Um, There's been talk before with Nico Ladero of Seattle that he's kind of tried to entice Suarez, you know, come play in MLS when you're ready and, you know, it'd be great fun and all this kind of thing. And and I think those two have quite a close relationship, but I, I couldn't see him going to Seattle. I think as well, it's worth noting that there was also a follow-up report that said that Beckham has reached out to Messi and said, look, when your Barcelona contract ends, how would you feel about coming to play in, in Miami? And I think this is what we're kind of seeing with MLS now. We're seeing an evolution in these designated players. It's, it's changing the, the landscape a little bit. You've still got the Zlatan Ibrahimovic's of this world who come to the league, the Bastian Schweinsteigers, who've got immense pedigree and mm. wealth of experience. But you've also got Miguel Almiron, players who are a little bit younger, who've still got their whole career ahead of them that teams want to build up. Yeah. It's no surprise to me that Beckham is going for the first option because I think he's going to need bums on seats. Yeah. Um, now, in fairness, you can still achieve that with an Almiron. I think Atlanta did a great job of doing that. But I think for him, he wants star power. I think because his name is attached, you almost need those stars to kind of take the shine off him a little bit and the, the focus off him and, and onto the field with with someone like Luis Suarez. Yeah, the, uh, the, their first year will be uh, next season, won't it, 2020. Um, the one thing I think is a bit strange with this, Dave Beckham always very switched on to the PR machine. And Luis Suarez, for me, is not the guy who you bring in who's going to be, you know, charming and a sportsman on the pitch. You're not going to get those things from Luis Suarez. So that's why I find it slightly strange. For him, I think it makes sense because I think next season, there's probably going to be a bit more competition. Barcelona, I would, I'd be amazed if they don't get themselves a striker in the summer. Um, we spoke on the, on the channel just a, a week ago, looking like it could be Antoine Griezmann. I know there's some stumbling blocks with that now. But Suarez can't be there forever. He's 32 years old. So for him, I, I understand it a little bit. I just don't get it from... David Beckham's point of view. So what it's worth noting, and I'm always wary to paint in broad brush strokes when I talk about this, but Miami has quite a large Hispanic market. Um, Now, there's a a good case to be made that just signing a player that is very lazy marketing, you actually have to be quite targeted Mm. and, and nuanced in the way you engage with fans like that. But I think at the same time, that's part, someone like Luis Suarez is probably going to appeal to a Miami market right. more than, let's just say, a Wayne Rooney, for yeah. example, if he had been available around the same time. Yeah. I think that's the other thing is that sometimes clubs do look at, look at that, even if it's not almost with the, the most detailed eye um, in terms of actually how you market the player properly. Yeah, true. And maybe into, if, you, if you need a megastar and you need them to come from South America, then you know Luis Suarez is, is quite high up on that list. So there you go. That is all your transfer gossip. You're all caught up now. Of course, all of these things could change like that. Um, So stick around with Ball Street. You'll find out loads of transfer news as the summer progresses. If you want to go check out Chris and Hennage's writing, then go follow him on Twitter at K Hennage, H-E-N-E-A-G-E. Am I right? Did I get it right? And that's why we're best friends. That's why we're, that's why we're the best friends that anyone could have. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button, subscribe to Ball Street, and we'll see you very soon.